We have a lot to cover in today's video, including some latest trade rumors around teams like the Montreal Canadiens, Vancouver Canucks, Ottawa Senators, Calgary Flames, and the Washington Capitals. Plus, we have some updates on teams like Columbus and Pittsburgh that have already made significant changes to their staffs. We have some signings and other offseason news coming up next. So welcome back to another video here at Top Shelf Hockey. We have a lot of news to get caught up on here. Of course, on the channel, where the past 24 hours have been focused on playoffs of course with the 23 Stanley Cup playoffs getting ready to start here tomorrow uh, obviously we have a prediction video with the full bracket challenge which has been the focus here over the past day or so uh, so certainly want to get back to the news we have a little bit to get caught up on and lots of rumors that have been surfacing since the end of the regular season over the past couple of days before I forget as well don't forget the Stanley Cup playoffs do get underway tomorrow night they start on Monday with four series starting Monday the other four series start on Tuesday we have created a league through the NHL.com website for the 2023 NHL bracket challenge so this is just for fun just for bragging rights if you want to submit your bracket through our league uh, to kind of see for fun who in our community can get the most correct and win uh, based on the best predictions for the Stanley Cup playoffs, my full bracket was released through the playoff prediction video uh, here yesterday on the weekend. I'd love to see what yours are as well, and we can talk about it further. So certainly the link is down in the pinned comment down below here. You'll see, uh, so if you click on that, you can go through and submit your bracket for the NHL Bracket Challenge for the 23 Stanley Cup playoffs in the Top Shelf Hockey League that I created. First up, we did have a bunch of players placed on waivers on Friday, which they did clear on Saturday, and now they've been assigned to their minor league affiliates. So uh, we had five players, including Nick Patan in Minnesota, Christopher Lynn in Vancouver, and three players in Nashville, including Michael LeCure and Mark Jankowski and Keeper Sherwood, were all placed on waivers so they could go down to their American Hockey League clubs to uh, finish up the seasons there and work with them, hopefully going towards their American Hockey League playoffs. So nobody was claimed, everybody got reassigned, and all was good. Usually you don't see a waiver claim this time of year because you can't add anybody to your roster uh to uh, to for the playoffs at this point the deadline's long gone and for the teams that are not in the playoffs while well, your season's over you're probably gonna take care of other business before you do that so it's not really something that you usually see now that we're past that into the playoffs you likely won't see much of anything at all in the waiver wire for some time there could be the odd thing pop up but usually at that point it would be for contract termination or or something else so on to a, a lot of other news here we're getting ready for game one of the Stanley Cup playoffs to get started here tomorrow night there is some concern over top center for the Bruins Patrice Bergeron he is questionable not a guarantee that he's going to play uh, he is dealing with an injury David Krejci on the other hand was uh, a full practice participant today so it's looking good like he will play but certainly uh, Bergeron's a huge piece of the pie one of the greatest two-way players of all time still playing at a very high level if he can't go that will certainly be a big blow for the Bruins but I will say this the Boston Bruins has had a record-setting phenomenal season and they've dealt with a lot of adversity especially early on when it comes to injuries and they manage just fine so I don't know that the Bruins faithful really need to be too concerned they've been able to find a way all year if they have to play a game without Bergeron hopefully they can continue to do just that now on to some other teams that have actually had already significant changes and latest updates and all when it comes to Columbus uh, they did uh, relieve head coach uh, Brad Larson of his duties uh, on the weekend here as well. Um, Elliot Freeman talking about the uh, potential suitors for that and what might be happening next. He says that uh, it might be a, a sneaky good job that a lot of people want. That's going to have a heavy amount of interest. I know other NHL insiders, including uh, Aaron Portsline, who's the beat writer for the Jackets for the Athletic, also uh, had an article talking about some potential candidates as well. Elliot Friedman's uh, main one that he mentioned in his latest work was uh, Peter Laviolette, the former coach of the Washington Capitals, who was just recently let go as well, or I guess you could say mutually parted ways with the Capitals. He was also on an expiring contract, and uh, so he technically wasn't fired. They just agreed that it wasn't in best interest of either party to do a new deal and for him to continue. So he's a free agent coach right now. Friedman wonders if he might be a good uh, fit in Columbus, one of somebody he talked to. Uh, one of his sources said that he thought that Laviolette would be a perfect fit there. Uh, other names have been mentioned by Aaron Portsland. And his article include uh, Bruce Boudreaux, of course, recently let go by the Vancouver Canucks. Claude Julian, who's been a free agent coach for some time, has done some work with Hockey Canada. Andrew Burnett, the former head coach of the Panthers, who's now back to being an assistant coach this year. Uh, and, of course, Spencer Carberry, uh, who's also a, I guess you could say, one of the assistant coaches around the NHL with the Leafs that's actually... Uh, you know, viewed upon as being one of the next up-and-coming head coaches. So he's expected at some point to get an opportunity. This might be the one 
lots of names up there. Several others that were mentioned as well. I thought they were the main ones that I felt were most relevant, but we'll see where that goes. They they don't have to rush. I'm sure they'll take their time. So Kekalan makes the the right move there in Pittsburgh. Uh, lots of lots of discussions around there from Penn's media and since the Hextall and Burke firing that happened a few days ago. Um, you know, a lot of Penn's media are talking a little bit more. A lot of times they know things, but don't necessarily put it out to the public um, until the right time. And uh, there's several Penn's writers, including Rob Rossi, the athletic, who says that um, from his knowledge, it sounds like Ron Hextall never really wanted to re-sign him getting Malkin last offseason and that he was kind of pushed into doing so. Uh, certainly previous ownership, Mario Lemieux and company, uh, wanted guys like Crosby, Malcolm, Latang to all be lifelong Penguins and retire as Pittsburgh Penguins. It was important to them. I, I don't know how important it is to the, the Fenway group that owns them now based on their comments that they've made since the uh, news broke of this decision. And they have talked about that. And it sounds like they also feel that way as well. At least they're saying, I mean, they're all under contract, so I'd expect nothing less regardless of what their true thoughts are. But at the same time, you know, Hextall seemed like he wanted to take the team in a new direction, but um, there was enough people around him in OC Report or two that just weren't happening. Uh, but certainly, and another thing that came out too was that the Mikhail Granlund trade that happened at the deadline, which was to me a disastrous deal. Uh, a lot of people are critiquing that and don't understand it. Apparently he was pushed to do that deal by an, an AGM, uh, which was, uh, he was also let go. So certainly, as uh, I guess a lot of people felt like Hextall was kind of soft and wouldn't stand up for what he really believed in and was certainly forced to make some moves that he didn't really want to do, although in the case of Malkin, I think you could argue that, that was a, a good idea, uh, obviously, but a lot of the other ones like Granlin and Carter, et cetera, proven not to be. It really sounds a lot too like Mike Sullivan, who's not only going to be the head coach, but obviously during this transition, while they're looking for a new president and GM, that he's probably going to have a heavy say in um, personnel decisions by the looks of it. Some of the other staff members that remain with the Penguins will be looking after things and uh, based on comments from Fenway uh, and their representatives, it sounds like Sullivan's going to have a lot of say. So we'll see. It's going to be interesting times in what direction they go in and uh, who those are the replacement people that come in to take on those new roles in Pittsburgh and Columbus that are freed up. Same thing in Washington. I haven't heard a whole lot about potential coaches there, but obviously they're along with the Ducks. Team's looking for new people here starting now. Uh, we also had a signing that took place while we were focusing on playoffs that is important too. The Minnesota Wild have extended uh, Freddie Goudreau. He's been a a great find, a little bit of a late bloomer. He's obviously pushing 30, 29 years old, but he gets a five-year contract extension with a $2.1 million cap hit with a modified no-trade clause that covers 15 NHL teams. Uh, I think this is a good deal for Billy Guerin, a couple of reasons. One, Goudreau has been a real good player for them. Uh, was certainly an underrated guy who plays an important role. Uh, certainly has picked up his offensive game. Um, and, he's, and with the cap situation that the Wild are facing for the next few years, uh, this is going to be a really valuable contract. Five years at $2.1 million for a guy who can play in the middle of the lineup is pretty solid. I mean, he's had 19 goals this year, 19 assists. Um, like I said, a late, relate uh, blooming type of player, but he's proven to be valuable to Minnesota. And for this kind of money, it's it's a real good deal. It takes him to about 34 years of age, which isn't too bad. I think I really like that deal for the Minnesota Wild. Uh, a two-year ELC has been signed by the Carolina Hurricanes. Uh, for young defenseman Dominic Fensor, who's a left shot D out of BU. He's got, uh, he was there for three years. He's 21 years old. Only 5'7", 153, but he's put up some real solid numbers. A good puck moving defenseman, so Carolina certainly had a lot of interest to get him under contract. And the Devils have also signed one of their draft picks for the 2020 draft, goalie Tyler Brennan, who's only 19, um, but he's 6'4", 185. He'll soon be he'll still be turning 20, obviously a few years after uh, being drafted here, but uh, he's been playing for the WHL's uh, pretty sure it's Cougar. So he's had a, a pretty solid run in junior. And we're obviously much so ready here to take that pro step. So um, be interesting to see how this affects the other Devils uh, goaltending depth within the organization as as well. Now, I uh, another piece of business on Montreal. There's some speculation that Paul Byron very well might be uh, at the end of his NHL career. I mean, we know he's had a lot of issues with his health. I obviously wasn't able to play this past season. I uh, would need a new contract. I don't think there's any scenario where Montreal offers to re-sign him as a player, but uh, debatable if he could get any work elsewhere as a player. It uh, sounds like he's talked to the Montreal Canadiens about an off-ice role likely in player development. If that works out, it sounds like he would retire and accept that opportunity. And if it doesn't, um, and then he's going to probably explore for agency and to see if he can continue playing elsewhere. But I think his first choice by the sounds of it 
would be just to be able to stay in Montreal. Of course, he's been there quite a while, some with his family, and uh, obviously after missing a whole season and going through what he's been through, makes a lot of sense that his playing days very well might be over. But we'll be interested to see how, uh, what happens next for Paul Byron. It could be onto an off-ice rule, possibly. Now, under the trade section video of the part of the video here today, I tell you, there's there's a lot of rumors flying from the teams that are under the playoffs right now. I mean, it's usually what happens. This is quite common every year. Once the regular season ends, within a day or two, they all do their locker cleanout day. They do one last media availability where media have access to all the players. A lot of players tend to speak, um, and obviously you get a lot of quotes that can be taken different ways, and it really gets a lot of chatter going around what things might uh, be happening in the offseason. It also gives media a chance to usually talk to GMs and coaches, and you can usually get a sense, too, of, of what they might be up to. So we'll start with Montreal since we just ended with them and Paul Byron. But certainly Montreal media has been talking about the fact that uh, there's a pretty good chance, at least they feel, that Joel Edmondson will be traded this offseason. And along with Mike Hoffman, uh, those two players are probably uh, two at the top of their list for, for moving from. Look, obviously, some guys are going to be UFA, might not be brought back. There's other players on this list of Montreal that could be moved to. But Joel Edmondson is a player, uh, the rationale behind it here is that he had a lot of interest of in the trade deadline. The only problem was a lot of teams were a little... Uh, shy to pull the trigger because he had missed so much time due to injuries. But obviously, once he came back and he finished up the season, he did play well. He looks fine. So I think that the interest is fair to say will pick back up again. Now they've had a chance to watch him play, which is the rationale here from different uh, media outlets in Montreal, especially in Montreal Hockey Now, which is the article I'm referencing here, talking about Joel Edmondson likely getting dealt. Now there's some speculation now that the price might not be as high as Ken Hughes was hoping for. I know originally there was some thought that Vero might be able to generate a first-round pick return for him at the trade deadline. Of course, it never happened, and he never went anywhere either. So, would he get that now? I, I have my doubts. And sometimes teams are more willing to overpay at the trade deadline because they're looking for certain types of players to really push them into being a stronger spot for the playoffs. The offseason, they have more time. There's more options, more in the market, and typically you don't see the prices be as high. Um, so if Joel Edmondson's not traded, he very well once again could be a trade deadline piece for the Montreal Canadiens next year. But at the same time, uh, you know, with his injury history especially, they might be reluctant to do that and take the chance if they go through next year and he gets hurt again, it could increase the probability that he's not traded. And then, of course, they get nothing in return. And they have a ton of defensemen there that are young and really looking for spots and a lot of which got some experience this year. I'd be curious to see what their regular decor looks like going into next season. Uh, same goes for Mike Hoffman after being scratched in the series or season finale. Sorry for a youngster. Obviously, it's pretty clear that he's not in their future plans. But again, they were trying to trade him all season, according to reports. But there just wasn't enough interest, uh, especially with his contract having another year on it. So now that we'll be into the final year of the deal, Montreal, I guess, could even maybe consider retaining some money and see if they can make something work for him to be able to move on. Now, lots of rumors of Washington. Capitals, of course, are a team that's uh, expected to be retooling. They want to be back in the playoffs, which is not going to be an easy challenge. But Brian McCall, the general manager, certainly appears like he could be one of the busier GMs around the NHL this offseason. Certainly some very interesting quotes coming out of the Capitals under immediate availability at the end of the season from both the Caps GM and the players. I know the, the GM himself had some things to say when it comes to Evgeny Kuznetsov. He even said that he wasn't overly pleased with Kuznetsov's season, thought he was better the year before, uh, and was kind of disappointed with uh, what, what he's seen this year. Kuznetsov himself was even asked about the reports that were out a while back saying that he had requested a trade in, uh, multiple times and that I uh, wonder what his future's like if he declined to even comment or talk about it. So that's certainly not a good indication. He didn't go out of his way to say, I, I want to be here, or those are not true, or... You know, what have you? So, like, to me, I, th I think if Brian McClellan can find a deal for Kristensov, I think we will see it happen. I think he will be a player that's discussed. The other thing that makes us feel that he's a you're more likely than wanting to get dealt is that he changed agents recently as well. So, typically, the agent will play a big role in talking to the uh, GM to try to facilitate a deal. And if he's unhappy that he never got his way to, to get traded before, Maybe he feels that a change in agency might be able to help push that along. So we will see. The other comments that were made by GM Brian McClellan that I found very interesting was on their longtime center, Nicholas Backstrom. Um, he basically said Backstrom needs to, to make a decision on his career. It makes to the same that, you know, 
when he came back from that major hip surgery he had, uh, I know based on what we've seen and with that surgery with other athletes, like it's it's not real common to see much of a return to the play. It's quite often career ending, and he obviously did put up some okay numbers, but certainly you know not nearly what he is used to. And you can tell he's not the same player, which is a huge shocker after what he's been dealing with and been through. But it kind of sounds like from the comments from Jim Brown McClellan saying he needs to make a decision on his career is like, you know, is he really fit to play? Is he really going to either have to consider, you know, um, a lower role, smaller role in the lineup? Um, you know, maybe no power play time. I don't know. Or is it a possibility that he could end up on LTIR? Is he really able to, to push himself to play? I don't know. But it, there's certainly some big concerns from the GM on his top two centermen. So you can expect uh, some activity and some chatter on that throughout the rest of the offseason. Of course, in Calgary as well, uh, we know there's been lots to talk about the Flames um, after being eliminated. We've heard lots of drama around the players and the coach and the relationship between Sutter and the coaches, or the players, sorry. And, of course, GM Brad Tree Living being on an expiring contract. Is he going to be back? I know Elliot Freeman's made comments numerous times. He thinks that Brad Tree Living could be back. I think he said that basically the Calgary ownership, according to what he's heard and what he feels, that they'd like to have him back. And it's kind of up to him if he wants to accept a new contract. Apparently, there were talks about an extension earlier in the year. And he decided just to wait on that and set it off to the side and wait to, to really decide. So, ultimately... It sounds like there was an offer, but it was more his doing to, to not accept and to see how things went first. So it might be a case where they're waiting for him to make a decision. I don't know. I mean, clearly the coach is under contract for two more years. I know if I've heard. And now Friedman says that he doesn't think that uh, they would fire Daryl Sutter because of the longer term deal in two more years that they're going to want to waste all that money. And they might try to find a way to make things better between Sutter and the players maybe make a few changes, or then you get GR, another insider in Frank Sarah Valley who's saying he feels there's a good chance the center could be fired. So hard to say which insider is going to be right here, but at the end of the day, when they did their media availability, there's a lot of players that give off a vibe that they weren't overly happy, and uh, especially talking to some of the players that are near the end of their contracts, like, for example, Mikhail Macklin and uh, Elias Lindholm were asked about extending and all that, and they didn't seem all that enthusiastic or positive. They're both kind of that, well, we'll see what happens. Like, you know, they're just, the way their body language was read and the way their words were chosen, It. I'm not saying they won out of Calgary. I don't think that's fair to say, but it certainly seems like they'd be, at this point at least, quite hesitant to get into a new contract extension with the team without really knowing more about the future direction. I think at this point, because they're going to be eligible on July 1st, depending on what the team does between now and then, would probably play a big role of anything of those players are even willing to consider it, or if they might want to just let it play out and see where it goes because they might want to see what other changes are happening before they really make that decision. As of right now, it sounds like some of them might be leery on re-signing, and that might be an issue. I mean, if they get too many guys that want to go, you've got Backlund, you've got Lindholm, Hanif, and all these guys. If they don't want to stay, and if they all eventually work their way out here over the next year, that could be a big blow to this team. So that's certainly not something I'm sure they want to see. The other comment I thought from Flames media availability that was interesting as well was Mackenzie Weger made comments about how they need a new arena. Um, and obviously it's not something you quite often hear the players talking about. You do hear about it in, uh, in different news stories and stuff, but generally it's not the players. But, uh, you know, I wonder it was between him and Huberdo who signed the long-term deals before they really ever got too far into things with after being acquired by the Calgary Flames, if they have any regrets at this point. You know, Elliot Friedman mentioned when it comes to Huberdo that there were some people who told him essentially that the way he was looking at it was, how do you turn that kind of money down? I mean, Brad Tree Living went to meet him in Montreal in the offseason before he ever played a game or practice or anything with the team. And all of a sudden they made him a huge offer. Um, and it was just too difficult for him to pass that up. And if he passes that up and he goes into the season, look how things went. Imagine if Huberdo would not have taken that contract and wanted to wait and let it play out. His numbers are down substantially over last year or the past couple of years. Uh, he'd be taking a big haircut on his pay. So he's probably happy in a way that he did take that contract. But at the same time, it's going to prove that to be difficult for a trade or anything else if he decides he does want to move at some point. So it's going to be challenging that way. But I don't know. Calgary's going to be a very interesting team to watch. Lots of things happening there, and we will see where everything goes. Now over to Vancouver. Uh, we know the Canucks are 
I don't. I honestly don't know how busy they're going to be because we've heard numerous things from Jim Rutherford and Patrick Alvey over the course of the last few months, and we haven't really seen a whole lot of action, a whole lot of activity in a sense. Um, so, how busy they will be, I don't know. But I know there was comments from Brock Besser and JT Miller, uh, both of which have been mentioned in various trade rumors. I guess from their perspective, I know JT Miller said because uh, he was asked point blank about the fact that his no trade clause kicks in July 1st with the new deal. And he said he was quite happy with the seven-year deal, never really thought about that too much, and doesn't think he's getting traded. So he wasn't really concerned about that clause kicking in when his new deal starts in July. And Brock Besser said, uh, even though he was reporting, and by good sources before, that he wanted to be traded, that he, he and his agent have talked to the team, and that they thought it might be best to get a fresh start, and his agent was able to talk to other teams, he said, his exact words were, to be completely honest with you, I don't want to be traded. And maybe there was a point in time where he did. Maybe he felt that way, but he said publicly now that he doesn't. Now, the Canucks, we do know, still, regardless of what they think of their end of the season being stronger, I, I hope they don't get a false sense of what they are as a team and make decisions too rashly because, to be honest, if they if they don't really look at things from the right perspective, they might get uh, you know a false sense of what they are. When players know that playoffs aren't happening and the pressure is off, they get a new coach. There's uh, you do to get a different perspective and you get a different men, uh, mental state for a lot of players, and it does impact results. And I just I also wonder how they're going to view things going into the offseason. But we know they want to try to compete next year, and it's not going to be easy. They do need to make some changes, but what are they going to be? Would Besser and Miller be a part of that? It sounds like they they both want to stay and be back and be a part of it. And it'd be interesting to see what the Canucks actually end up doing. And then lastly, in Ottawa, I just want to touch on uh, what Bruce Guriak had put out in a report regarding Alex to break it. Now, uh, after they did their year-end media, um, Guriak, who's you know a long-time reporter there for the Ottawa Sun, does a little bit of stuff on TSN, I put out an article saying that his own personal opinion was that he didn't think the Brickett was going to want to sign long-term. Well, then there seemed to be other reports spitting off of that, saying the Brickett doesn't want to sign here, the Brickett won't sign with the Ottawa Senators, and all of that is complete fabrication. Now, Gary Ock did not say that he had any reports or sources or anything saying the Brickett didn't want to stay. That's not what he said at all. All he said was he had a gut feeling that the Brickett did not want to sign long-term. But when the Brickett was talked to and his media availability, his words were that he needs to talk to his wife and agent, family, but he was open to anything. He never really said anything, in my opinion, that made people think that he didn't want to be there. Uh, I, to break it, you got to remember, I think, is the whole time he's been in Ottawa, and even before that, he's not exactly, um, I think, the, the most comfortable doing media. I think his, a lot of his interviews always seem just a little bit awkward compared to some guys. I think he doesn't really know what to say sometimes, and his edit can be an awkward situation for some people. Uh, I don't really think he said anything to lead us to think that he doesn't want to stay. But at the same time, he didn't come out and be like, yes, yeah, sign me up long term. And just because he wasn't super enthusiastic, like, he didn't say anything about wanting to not be there. And I don't really think that those reports were accurate at all. Uh, to me, Bruce Gira can put a negative spin on things sometimes. So you have to take his reporting with a grain of salt, in my opinion. I know he's got a lot of sources. I know he's well connected. Um, but uh, just, I don't know, he just came across as being really negative in, in that sense. So those are all your trade rumors for today. Lots of talk about There's going to be lots more brewing here in the rumor mill over the next uh, number of days and weeks now that we're fully into off-season mode for half the NHL. I will be starting a series coming soon as well, looking at the off-season plans for all these teams. That will be coming here shortly once the playoffs get underway, and uh, we'll kind of go from there. But certainly, uh, let me know your thoughts on all of today's news and rumors in the comments. We'll talk about it further. If you're new to the channel, make sure you subscribe. Stick around. We'll keep you up to date with all the latest news. Rumors and analysis of all 32 NHL teams. Thank you for watching, and I'll catch you next time.